Hello everyone, welcome aboard Submarine Bakuna here at Independence Seaport Museum in Philadelphia. My name is Greg, and on today's video, we'll be taking an in-depth look at the Torpedo Data Computer. Welcome to Deep Dives. Submarine Bakuna, like most subs of her era, is armed with torpedo tubes at both the bow and the stern. These tubes are installed parallel to the longitudinal axis of the boat, meaning they point either straight ahead or straight astern. Unlike deck guns, which are often installed in traversable mounts or armored turrets, torpedo tubes are immobile. A torpedo tube will always face wherever the bow is facing or wherever the stern is facing. Consequently, a submarine had to be pointed straight at its target in order to fire because the torpedo launched from the tube would always travel in a straight line. This is fine if you've managed to point your boat directly at your target, but circumstance is not always so kind, and captains frequently found themselves at odd angles when chasing a target. Because they could not guarantee that they could always have that perfect shot when lining up for an attack, the Navy needed to provide them a way that they could at least guarantee their torpedo would reach the target even if the sub itself was not pointed straight at it. During World War I, calculating and plotting a torpedo intercept course was a manual process done by hand with the aid of various slide rules such as the Mark 8 angle solver, colloquially called a banjo because of its shape, and the Iswas a circular slide rule that predicted where a target will be based upon where it is now and where it was. But manual methods such as these were woefully inaccurate and relied heavily upon the competency of the user. It wasn't until the middle of World War II that the U.S. Navy began developing and using homing torpedoes with the creation of the Mark 24 mine and Mark 27 acoustic homing torpedo. Even so, the bulk of the torpedoes used during the war were of the straight running variety with the Mark 14 being the most common. A straight running torpedo has a gyro compass control system that ensures the torpedo will run a straight course. A torpedo could be compelled to run a course different from that of the firing submarine by adjusting a parameter called the gyro angle, which sets the course of the torpedo relative to the course of the submarine. Determining the gyro angle required a real-time solution of a trigonometric function, and then the gyro inside the torpedo had to be manually adjusted to match the solution. Needless to say, all of this took time, and by completion, the solution you came up with was often no longer good. The Navy needed a way to continuously update a torpedo's gyro angle while it was in the torpedo tube. In 1932, the Bureau of Ordnance initiated development of the Mark I torpedo data computer with Armor Corporation and Ford Instruments. This produced the Mark I TDC in 1938. The Mark I was retrofitted into older boats from the V-Class up to the Salmon Class, the newest class of submarine at the time. The first class of submarine built with TDC use in mind was the Tambor Class in 1939. By then, TDC design had progressed significantly to the Mark III. Space was allocated for the device in the conning tower. It would be the Mark III TDC that did the heavy lifting of torpedo fire control for the bulk of World War II proving to be one of the best fire control systems of the war. It was succeeded, but not entirely supplanted, by the Mark IV TDC in 1943. The Mark IV TDC functioned in much the same way as the Mark III, but included a receiver section that could take target information electronically from either sonar, radar, or the periscope without the need for manual input. Submarine Bakuna is equipped with a Mark IV TDC. The torpedo fire control problem is, at its heart, trigonometric, meaning at its most basic, the mathematics surrounding it are rooted in the study of the angles and sides of triangles. Determining the value of the gyro angle required solving a complex trigonometric equation with variables for the velocity of the target, the velocity of the torpedo, the deflection angle between the proposed torpedo course and the line of sight to the target, and the angle on the bow relative to the target's course and line of sight to the target. By solving the equation for the angle of deflection, you can then solve for the gyro angle by subtracting the value of the angle of deflection from the bearing angle, which was the angle between the submarine's course and line of sight to the target. This is, of course, an extremely oversimplified version of the actual fire control equation. Range played no part in determining the solution. This equation worked for service vessels firing torpedoes from directable mounts because the torpedo director and its operator are mounted on top of the tubes. 
Because the range between the director and the target was the same as the range between the point of torpedo launch and the target, it could be balanced out of the equation. On submarines, however, the fire control system was centralized. The director and operator were not located with the torpedo tubes at the bow or stern, but in the conning tower roughly amidships. The distance between director and tube created problems with parallax, which is the displacement or difference in position of a viewed object seen from two different locations. In this case, the two locations are the conning tower, where the fire control party is located, and the torpedo tube, where the torpedo is located and launched. The fire control equation must be modified to reflect the distance between these two positions, further complicating it. The TDC was introduced as a method to aid the fire control party in solving for the gyro angle as quickly and efficiently as possible. The faster you find your solution, the more accurate your torpedo attack would be. It allowed the input data to be continuously updated as the situation changed, and therefore the value of the gyro angle would likewise be instantaneously updated with the new information. Because the technology allowing the gyro angle to be set while already loaded in the torpedo tube had been developed in the early 20s, this further meant that the gyro itself could be set and adjusted along with the angle value. This meant that the gyro could be adjusted right up to the moment of firing, guaranteeing the most accurate possible shot. The TDC can be broken down into four major sections, the position keeper, the angle solver, the sound bearing converter, and the torpedo spread generator. The position keeper is responsible for tracking and marking the predicted present location of a target. This was critical aboard submarines because limiting periscope exposure reduced the risk of being spotted by the enemy. Because a fire control party could not have their eyes on the target continuously, they relied on the position keeper to track their target using the best information they could provide it. There are seven variables that are input into the TDC. Each one of them has a crank to manually enter the value and an indicator dial on the display to show what the current input value is. The first input is target speed. This value is usually an estimate made by the sonar operator or taken from the estimated course plotted out by the tracking party. The second is initial range. This value is usually obtained from either the periscope or radar, but in some cases can be taken from sonar. As the range changes, the TDC will generate revised values and display them on the counter. Third is initial target relative bearing. The TDC will generate the value of the target's relative bearing based on the other inputs, but the initial target relative bearing value gives it a point to start from. Next is target course. The value of this input is typically determined by navigation plot. Target course was assumed to remain constant during an attack, unless the future observation forced the value to be revised. The last two values are the speed and course of the submarine. The speed is taken from the submarine's pedometer, while the course is taken from the submarine's gyro compass. Both values are automatically and continuously updated from their respective measurement devices without the need for manual input. The angle solver takes the inputs from the position keeper as well as the parameters set by the type of torpedo being fired and uses them to compute the value of the gyro angle so that the torpedo will arrive at the correct place at the correct time in order to score a hit on the target. There are two inputs that must be manually set into the angle solver for a successful computation. They are the corrected torpedo running speed and the torpedo run difference. The corrected torpedo running speed is the speed in knots set into the TDC that is derived from the basic torpedo running speed by accounting for variables such as water temperature, battery electrolyte temperature, and running depth that might deviate from standard. The torpedo run difference is the distance in yards a torpedo travels in a given time at basic running speed minus the distance traveled in the same amount of time with the corrected running speed. Both variables have a crank for manual input. The sound bearing converter exists for one reason, and that is to account for the parallax involved with determining a target's bearing using the sonar. Bearings taken through the periscope or radar do not experience this parallax. There is no appreciable time delay for radar or light waves bouncing off an object and returning to the receiver. The same is not true for sonar. The speed of sound through salt water is approximately 1,669 yards per second. 
By comparison, the speed of light through the atmosphere is approximately 327 million yards per second. Because the speed of sound is so much slower, the target will move during the time it takes for the sonar ping to reverberate off it and return to the receiver. Thus, by the time a bearing is taken by way of sonar, it is obsolete the moment it is received. The sound bearing converter accounts for this, turning the sonar bearing into a bearing that matches more closely the bearing taken from the periscope or radar. Lastly is the torpedo spread generator. This is the last function the TDC is designed to perform. Because of the inaccuracies inherent in finding and inputting the variables required in solving the fire control problem, particularly at greater ranges, torpedoes were often fired in salvos or spreads to provide the greatest chance of striking a successful hit. There are two types of spreads commonly used when firing a torpedo salvo. The first is a longitudinal spread. All the torpedoes in the spread would be fired using the same gyro angle so that they trailed each other in the water. As the target crossed the point of intersection, the torpedoes would continue to strike it along the length of its hull. The time between firing each torpedo was based upon the target's length and speed. The second spread is a divergent spread. This spread could be performed in a number of different ways depending on where you wanted to strike your target first either the bow, middle, or stern before spreading on to the other two locations, but all involve adjusting the gyro angle of each successive shot just enough to send it on a course that would allow all of them together to cover the length of the target. Divergent spreads also include an element of the longitudinal spread in that each torpedo was fired one at a time with an interval between each launch. This was to prevent the wake of any one torpedo from disrupting the rest and driving them off course. The receiver section is unique to the Mark IV TDC, which is what Bakuna has. It removes the need for manual input of bearing and range from an operator, and instead takes them directly from either the periscope, the radar, or the sonar, depending on what you've set your switches to. This upgrade over the Mark III TDC removed enough human error to further increase the odds of success when making an attack. Well, that does it for this video. If you enjoyed it, let us know by liking and sharing it. Then head down to the comment section and leave us suggestions for topics you'd like to see us cover in future videos. As always, thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.